This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less tax. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of Wealth Ability. So, biggest issue right now going on, it seems in the news, is the climate, but more so is energy and what type of energy and what's coming with energy. And do we, are we going all electric? Do we go to uh, what happens with fossil fuels? Do we go to nuclear? Do we go to hydrogen? Whatever we're going to. Um, and we have uh, a great guest today for this, Dan Fiorino, who uh, this is his topic is, and this is, is his discussion. He is at American Education. He wrote the book, The Clean Energy Transition, which is perfect um, for what we're talking about. Um, and then the sub subtitle of Policies and Politics for a Zero Carbon World. So really interesting. Dan, really happy to have you on the show today. Um, thank you so much. And would you um, just tell us a little bit about, you know, what's your background? Why are you discussing this and what's your interest in it? Well, I, um, I'm a political scientist by training, but um, ended up having a career at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and always looked at big picture issues. And then I came back to a university um, about 12, 12 years ago and um, to teach an environmental policy. But I got increasingly interested in, in clean energy. Because when you think about the environment, you think about air pollution that affects human health. You think about all kinds of damage to ecosystems, you know, oil spills and um, catastrophic uh, failures of various kinds. And, and you think about, obviously, the effects of, of climate change, of which the current energy um, system is really the cause of at least two thirds of the problem. Um, it, it's hard to get away from energy. So I got very interested in in the whole issue of, of clean energy and thought if we could fix the energy system, if we could decarbonize, we also would reduce air pollution very significantly um, and achieve a lot of other environmental goals. So that's how I got into clean energy. And I just thought it was a really a fascinating subject. Interesting. Uh, and I've always been interested. Now, I went to school at the University of Texas. So I, my background is the other kind of energy is the fossil fuel yeah. energy and um, actually uh, took a, a, a law course um, on uh, oil and oil and gas law. And so I have a, a very strong background in that. So I'm very interested in energy. Let's start with kind of let's kind of set a premise here. And um, from an energy standpoint, meaning that we're we're using the energy for um, in the economy, how big a driver is energy and how important is energy in the world? It may seem obvious, but I want to kind of get your take on because I I, I think this is it, it can't be understated is my is my thought. Tell me, would you tell us what your thoughts are? Yeah, I I agree. It can't be understated. I mean, the the modern world as we know it and, and modern prosperity in um, developed countries was made possible by energy, <laughs> um, which usually is defined as the ability to do work beyond uh, just having human and animal muscle. So, um, you know, going back to the days of the Industrial Revolution, the emergence of coal, um, and then the emergence of oil and eventually natural gas and and nuclear power, and now more recently wind and solar power, energy is absolutely strongly connected with economic growth and development. There's there's no way around that. And it's also obviously uh, critical to, to modern lifestyles. So I, I think, I, I forget the exact number, but um, there are sort of calculations for what percentage of, of the global economy is devoted to energy and how does that look in different countries? And that's significant. But I think the fact that energy is just so pervasive and so much a part of modern life and really essential to modern prosperity. So we need energy. That is absolutely clear. The question is, 
where do we get it and how do we use it and and what effects does it have on the world? It, exactly. So so we relied on fossil fuels for literally hundreds of years because before before it was oil, it was coal. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when, when you look at that, that's, what's driven our equipment. That's what driven our machinery. That's what's driven our industrialization. And that's, what's driving the industrialization of countries like China, India, Africa, they are heavily reliant, even more so than, yeah. than the U S perhaps on, um, fossil fuels and it looks like will be in, in the future, but where do you see, so let's kind of, we, we've established where we are. Where do you see, uh, Okay. 20, 30 years from now, what do you think, you know, get out your crystal ball, tell us what you think, where we will be in 20 or 30 years. In 20 or 30 years, I, th I think we will be um, well on our way. The question is how much on our way to a significantly cleaner, certainly in developed countries, clean energy system. And um, in in the emergency and rapid growth economies, where you, you are absolutely right, there's a huge demand for energy and thus for fossil fuels. I think the transition will be well underway. So I, I think um, in most of the world, um, wind and solar power will be the basis of the electricity systems. So we won't entirely eliminate fossil fuels, but we should be very close to eliminating them. And all, all clean energy scenarios start with the electricity system, because that's where the powers and the benefits of renewables like wind and solar and you know hydro, which has long been a part of renewable energy and geothermal and so, some other sources that are more on the drawing boards, um, that's where they can really contribute. So the whole premise of, of this transition is you um, decarbonize the electricity system and you move as rapidly as you can to, to um, mainly rely on wind and solar. That's what most of the scenarios call for. And probably some nuclear. I know nuclear is controversial, but most um, scenarios that I consider to be realistic have some role for nuclear power. And, and maybe later we can get to some yeah, I, I, I'd like, like to get that. I, I I live in Phoenix, Arizona, home of the Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station, and uh, I uh, actually worked um, for the uh, company Arizona Public Service. I worked for them for several years, yeah. and uh, who who runs that um, nuclear plant? Um, but before we get there, so you see this as basically this is something that's moving. It's so there, because there's this constant fight, right? You have this fight between the the fossil fuel people and the saying, "Well, wait a minute, you've got all these issues over here," and the renewable um, people. You think that this is moving at such a rate that it, it will not be stopped? Um, I don't know if I could say it will not be stopped. I I think the the transition to clean energy is well underway. Um, the most significant factor have been the, the rapidly falling costs of, of wind and um, solar photovoltaic um, generation. And I think markets are recognizing that. So we're seeing changes. And I think now public policy in the latest example in the United States is the Inflation Reduction Act, which um, investors should pay a lot of attention to because they're just Huge opportunities. We, we will get to that one. Yeah, yeah, good. So I, I think the, the clean energy transition is underway for a variety of reasons. I think um, governments are, are smart to try and accelerate that transition and make sure it takes hold. So there's a, certainly a role for government in helping to move it along. There's also a very important role for government and public policy just to manage and coordinate all the different parts of this transition. For example, um, things like the Inflation Reduction Act create lots and lots of incentives to increase generation through renewables and electric vehicles and those things. But we have to build the transmission capacity to get the energy from where it's generated um, to where it's consumed. And, and so there's gonna be a lot going on for that. So. Those kinds of issues, I think, are going to require a lot of attention. 
So, so what do you see as the primary issues um, and obstacles uh, when we're talking about converting to renewable energy? So I think um, the, the price issue is on its way to, certainly it's much improved over 10 years ago. I mean, 20 years ago, if you talked about renewable energy, you were mostly talking about hydropower and maybe some bio, biomass. Um, wind and solar just were not competitive in the marketplace. They are now. <laughs> I've, um, you frequently see in the energy literature that in, in two thirds of the world, it's now cheaper to generate electricity through wind and solar or other renewables than it is with fossil <laughs> fuels. So, so that's happening. I think the barriers will be getting the scale of investment some public, but mostly private investment that is is needed to um, move this transition along because there's just going to be a huge demand for, for investment and financing. Um, I think doing all the infrastructure, the transmission lines, the approvals for siting of um, uh, and renewable generation sites, just charging stations for electric vehicles a premise of this transition is that we're going to move fairly rapidly <laughs> from um, an oil-based transportation system to one that's based on electric vehicles, at least for the passenger fleet. Well, that means we need a whole lot of charging infrastructure. So all that, all those gas stations that we see on on the corner, we we need to come up with something similar. So I think it's the investment, it's the infrastructure, and it's the planning and coordination and building the right set of incentives that, that are the potential roadblocks. Let me ask you about a couple of others. Um, one, one being, which is, I think, one of the biggest questions that comes up with renewables is reliability. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, wind, <laughs> wind, wind is great when the wind's blowing, but yeah. You know, I travel to San Diego all the time. We see, or, or or Los Angeles in a car, and I'm seeing the windmills, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of times they're not they're not turning, <laughs> okay? And solar, we all know, uh, yeah. solar solar's great in Arizona, <laughs> right? It's great in Arizona. Maybe not so much in the Upper Peninsula of Mich Michigan. Um, yeah. So so and 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 again, it's only you know, half the day at the most, right? Yeah. So so how do you, so what do you see is going to happen in order to make that, when you say wind and solar will be the predominant energy sources, how do they overcome that reliability mm -hmm. issue, which is to me the biggest issue with wind and solar? That uh, you're absolutely right. That is a big issue. And um, in in the energy field, it's described as as grid integration. That is how do we reliably integrate variable or intermittent sources of energy, wind and solar, a classic, um, into a, a reliable electricity system? Because the electricity, we expect when we when we pull the light switch or, or we turn on the TV or whatever, that something will happen. <laughs> right, or so, in the winter, we expect heat. Yes, in the winter we expect heat, and in the summer we expect cooling, especially in Arizona. Exactly, all those kinds of things. So, um, I I say in the book that the the quickest way to to kill a clean energy transition is to have an unreliable electricity system. So exactly. that absolutely is critical, and that's why there are different ways that we can try and integrate. Um, renewable electricity, wind and solar generate electricity into the grid. One is um, have have relationships among different grid systems so they can draw on different sources, sort of expand the grid. Another is um, really working hard to manage demand. With electricity, a lot of it's these peaks where mm -hmm. you have to meet a peak demand and then yep. maybe for an hour or two. And then, so trying to maybe even those out through you know, tiered pricing and communication with users and those kinds of things. That's also where the case for nuclear and maybe, you know, some role for natural gas is there because nuclear does give you steady 
baseline flow of electricity. Yeah. And that can be very important for balancing out. And it is, and it is very cheap and it is yeah. perfectly clean. So except for, you know, obviously you've got spent fuel rods, but you know, Palo Verde's yeah. actually been very successful. I mean, I think Palo Verde is actually a really good example. Um, Palo Verde nuclear generating station, um, mm -hmm. what we call the BRTs out there, the big round things. And uh, <laughs> that's literally what in, the nuclear engineers call, call the uh, uh, containment facilities, the BRTs. And, um, um, but so, okay. So one of the things that comes up then, if you're talking about interrelationship of the grid um, is transmission, right? Or, mm -hmm. you, and, and then you've got transport on top of that. So let's talk about transmission first, because it's a little different than transport. So for transmission, you know, still transmission lines lose a good 30% of their mm -hmm. energy. So it, we don't have that really efficient um, uh, ability to transmit electricity over um, long distances. Okay, we can do it short distances, but we're yeah. still losing a lot. Um, so, what, what do you see in, in that area? Do you, are, are you seeing technological developments that are changing that? How do you see that um, improving? Yeah, I, I know l less about the the technology for transmission. I know that. Um, from a public policy perspective, a big issue lately has been permitting. Mm -hmm. um, just getting permits for transmission lines um, can take well four years, <laughs> and, and you're, and you're going to have or more. Uh, you're going to have to have way more transmission lines because you're using way yeah. more electricity. You know, yeah, if you eliminate, yeah, yeah. If you eliminate yeah. fossil fuels in your cars, I mean. Uh, you know, cars aren't free. Electric cars aren't free. I, my my wife drives a, a, a little BMW electric car. And, um, you know, while it's less expensive, it's not free. <laughs> you're still right. paying. You're still paying, I think, the equivalent of about 11 cents, um, mm -hmm. you know, a mile. So, um, and then we have the second issue, which is transport. So yeah. transmission being different. So because, of course, energy is important when it comes to military um, energy and how do you transport that energy? I mean, we, we all, you know, if you look at World War II, World War II was lost, fought and, and won and lost over energy. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was all over oil, right? Um, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was Romania's oil. It was, uh, you know, Hitler could not get the energy that he needed. Um, in order to do what he wanted to do. So that actually played a major role and it continues to play a major role. It plays a major role right now in Ukraine. So how do you see that? I mean, what, what do you see happening from a transport standpoint? Because to me, that is certainly one of the biggest issues from a defense standpoint. Of course, energy is a lot about defense. Yeah, well, and, and the national security aspects, sometimes the term used is energy security, are very important. And that's where I think you can make a very strong case for renewables because you don't have to depend on importing oil from Russia or, or Saudi Arabia or somewhere else. Because, and when people talk about using domestic sources of energy, well, yeah, that applies to fossil fuels, but what's more domestic than wind in the sun, which is available? I mean, nobody owns it. Once you have the facility up and operating, the the source of energy is free. You have to deal with the the intermittency and those kinds of issues, and they're certainly challenging, but not impossible to solve. So I think one of the advantages of renewable energy or, or clean energy solutions is that you avoid a lot of those transportation problems because you don't have to physically move the oil um, in particular from one place to another you and, and, still have to generate the electricity and i, I was gonna say you, you, so you, it was a different set of issues yeah exactly i mean if i'm if you're rolling tanks um across the ukraine or you're flying a plane you've got to have the electricity and of course that's going to be the first thing that the opposition is going to target yeah is you know is is those big those those big developments you know the the power grid um obviously so um that, I, I just think that's a really interesting issue because I think the transport, I get your, I get that side of it that, um, you know, I, I think Germany has done itself a huge disservice, um, frankly, um, in relying so much on Russian uh, natural gas when it had all these 
great nuclear plants. And so let, let's kind of transition a little bit because I want to transition to the types of renewables, okay? Because we talk so much about wind and solar and, and so forth, but let, let's talk about the other types of renewables first and let's come back to wind and solar and some of the challenges that, that revolve around those, what you call the primary sources. So let's let's start with nuclear because here you've got Germany on one hand who's decommissioned all of its nuclear plants. And you have France who's who's like doubling down on nuclear. And yet they're both clean energy focused. And so uh, talk about that whole debate in nuclear. I, I will tell you, I'm a fan. Um, so I'll start there. But um, but I'm interested in, in the debate and why not nuclear? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the different approaches taken in Europe toward nuclear power are very interesting. And I think it, a, a lot of this goes back to the oil embargoes of the 1970s and the recognition that depending on imported oil was very risky. I mean, in European countries, with a few exceptions, don't have a lot of their own right. oil and gas. So the, the decision in Denmark, for example, where there was a strong anti-nuclear sentiment was to, to um, develop wind. And now they have a very substantial wind sector. They, they help deal with the intermittency by importing a lot of hydroelectricity from Norway. So <laughs> they had some possible solutions. France went very heavily into nuclear. Um, so that was one set of choices. Germany, more of a mix, but um, for the Green Party in Germany and Green Parties in Northern Europe generally, nuclear energy was always a big issue. Um, as, as one writer wrote, it, it, it's in their DNA and uh, specifically anti-nuclear right. sentiment. And I think we just saw that surviving and that was a strong factor. And then after Fukushima, um, th that's like that sort of closed the deal. So yeah, I, I, I don't think they were really smart choices. And there have been studies that calculate just the air pollution impacts of having to restart some old coal plants yep. and increasing particulate and other kinds of emissions. There, there are a lot of premature deaths and a lot of illness associated with that that you wouldn't have had with nuclear. Um, so countries are gonna make all these choices. Uh, I agree nuclear should still be on the table. There are some newer technologies that if they pan out could be very successful, small modular, well, that's nuclear. what France is going to, right? It's going to the it's going to the smaller, you know, in the US, we've gone in the last 20, 30 years to a lot of the small um gas-fired power plants, right? That actually an, a factory might have its own gas-fired plant rather than mm -hmm. relying on the grid. And um it looks like France is going that same direction, but with nuclear. I th I think that's uh, really interesting. On top of that, I find it interesting that Inflation Reduction Act actually has incentives for nuclear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, again, in, in if you look at virtually all of the what I consider mainstream or realistic scenarios for, for clean energy, there is a role for nuclear to, to balance out the grid, to provide that steady source of baseline power, potentially to, you know, produce green hydrogen, although they I think they call it pink hydrogen with nuclear, but basically non-fossil fuel hydrogen. Um to meet uh, other other kinds of needs and and with small modular um generators you could be meeting a particular need on a local basis so we've got nuclear there's that big debate going on but it is reliable i mean that's the you know the great thing about nuclear is it's inexpensive and it's reliable um the only issue being you know the the safety but the reality is uh that um We've had very few serious accidents in nuclear, um, frankly, compared to oil spills. <laughs> I mean, yeah. nuclear has been way safer, uh, frankly. Yeah. Than, it's sort than, of the uh, the worst case for nuclear, at least on the old big centralized um, reactor model, are, are so scary that I think that has inspired a lot of public opposition. And, and certainly safety is an important issue. 
and that's what these newer generations they they call them third and fourth generation reactors are designed to overcome and the smaller scale um, can help reduce costs and also make it a more versatile source so i think nuclear has to be on the table and you're right the, the, it's it's recognized in in a lot of these different um financial incentives well and and you know i think it seems to me like one of the things that has to happen is the nuclear industry and actually the proponents of nuclear need to do a better job educating so for example i remember when i started and i started at arizona public service um 1990 okay so it was a long time ago and i remember going out there and going through the visitor center and watching the, watching this film they actually put a 747 on rails and they ran at full speed into a concrete wall that was built out of the concrete that's used to protect the nuclear reactors and there was literally not a scratch on the on the wall but yeah. there the the plane disintegrated so, you know, there's things like this. People think, well, what if, a, you know, well, we have 9-11, but we have we run into a nuclear plant. Well, um, clearly not an issue, right? I mean, it's an issue for those running into it, but it's not an issue for the nuclear plant itself um, because it, it, the, the protection is so strong. So that kind of education clearly will need to be done. But let's kind of turn a little bit to the wind and solar. And, and one of the big issues that has kind of be become public lately is the mining um, because in order to build the the panels and, and and particularly build the batteries because you have to have a lot of batteries if you're mm -hmm. going to run electric cars because they run on a battery if you're going to transport if you're going to store um, solar especially because it's intermittent by definition it's intermittent um, it, um, except in the summer in Anchorage right but because it's intermittent then what you have to do is you have to have really good batteries. I found myself, I put solar on my house several years ago and uh, the batteries went down and my utility costs doubled overnight because yeah. the batteries are so important to yeah. being able to efficiently use that energy. So we've got this issue between um, drilling. It's like, mm -hmm. we're going to go from drilling to mining because of the batteries. So, how do, how do you address that? I mean, you know, historically, the, the, the green parties have been against mining, <laughs> and now we're going to do more mining. And we've got lithium, we've got all of these sourcing issues um, that it's it's really hugely impactful on the environment. So how, how does that get balanced out? Yeah, I, I think that is one of the really tough issues because, yeah, for, for batteries, uh, lithium, uh, cobalt, copper, yeah. lots of materials. Um, and that involves some environmental damage of various kinds. And in, in particular, for example, some huge percentage of, of cobalt comes from Democratic Republic of Congo. So that's one place, a very authoritarian government. There are concerns about child labor and a lot of sort of social issues. And so I, I agree that's a, a very tough issue. And, you know, in, in writing this book, reading about various barriers, some people say, oh, this is a solvable problem. And others say this is going to be a serious issue. So there seem to be some, <laughs> some different points of view. I know that um, a priority like for, for battery storage is how, how do you do it with or what are the alternatives to lithium? And that may involve other critical materials. Right. How, do you, how do you do Teslas with... Um, batteries with less cobalt, those kinds of things. So, you know, I, I assume there'll be progress with that, but I, I agree that's going to be a very challenging issue. Um, we're we're, we're going to see a lot less damages from the oil and oil and gas and, and coal mining, and the damages are historically very substantial, but there are going to be another set of issues because it's going to be more mining, and it's going to be, as you pointed out earlier, more demand for electricity. And just having all these electric vehicles in the fleet, yeah, we're we we want to make use of wind and solar generate electricity, but we need to be ready for that. So so let's move to um, hmm. you, you you brought up the Congo, and uh, we we need to recognize that uh, the West is only about twenty percent of the population of the world, 
And the rest of the world does not seem to be going this direction. So China does not seem to be going renewable. Um, India does not seem to be going renewable. Uh, Africa is certainly not going to go renewable because they have so many resources. That seems like a very, very uh, un unlikely scenario that Africa goes to renewable in the any time near future. Um, so how do you deal with that? I mean, it's it's great. You know, let, let's say you've got, so California is going renewable, France is going renewable, um, but then you have most of the world that's not. And we know that, you know, you, you don't get to contain pollution. Uh, it doesn't just stick in one place. It moves, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so, so how do you see that evolving? Because to me, that's one of the arguments that I keep hearing from the fossil fuel people is, I don't understand. We're doing this, and we're having we're going to have a negligible effect because eighty percent of the world is not. So, how do you how do you see that evolving? Yeah, I uh, um, I think the the developed countries, the the, the um, post industrial e economies of the world, the U.S., Canada, the British Commonwealth countries, um, most of Europe um, are are moving toward the, the goal of, of carbon neutrality, net zero carbon mm -hmm. by 2050. And I think the odds are that, you know, sometime around 2050, 2060, we should be pretty much there. Um, in rapid growth economies with big populations, and I, I, I think I just read that India is about to surpass China as the most populated country in the world within the next month or two. Um, those both of those countries, India and China, have high economic growth rates. A little slower lately, but you know they'll probably pick up again. India, in particular, and there's going to be a tremendous appetite for energy, and they both have a lot of coal. <laughs> and you know when you're trying to meet um, feed the economic system and provide the energy necessary, and if you have fossil fuels. Um, you're probably going to use them. And um, we know- well, that As an example, we just saw China do a deal with Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Right? We, we've seen China and their, their, their relationship with Russia. We've seen India that has not condemned Russia, um, even though they're really part of the non-Russia, but they're part of BRICS, right? So um, you, you see all these countries wanting to enter BRICS, which is that coalition- of countries, um, you know, uh, that is really not going towards renewables right now. So, so how does that evolve? I mean, how does that actually happen? How, how, how does how do you get that to happen? And in all the scenarios that I looked at, um, economic growth is going to be highest in in those countries in Southeast Asia generally, and eventually in Africa. Now, there are some African countries that are trying to move toward um, a cleaner energy system. Morocco gets a lot of credit for um, investments in solar. Kenya has some um, excellent um, geothermal resources, but the demand for energy will be so strong as they enter into rapid growth phases with large populations that there'll be a real temptation to <laughs> use use what's available and that's a lot of fossil fuels. So there, I think the it's really important for the, the rich countries to be part of global financing mechanisms to share technologies. Um, I, th I think there's a role that um, the US and, and the Europeans and Japan and other countries can play in supporting that transition, but Yes, uh, um, that's where I would say most of the worries are about arriving at a clean energy transition. And the, the, the countries now have widely adopted um, net zero goals by sometime around mid-century. So uh, the, the president, President Biden, has adopted uh, 2050. Um, the EU is um, 2050, and some countries are even sooner. Um, China says they will be carbon neutral by 2060. We'll see. India has set a 2070 goal. So they're recognizing that it's going to be more more difficult and they're entering into a rapid growth phase. But um, 
whether they get there or not, I think that's going to be a challenge. But you know, we hit we 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 can we in the rich countries can help influence that. I was going to say it, it, it isn't it a little disingenuous for us to complain about their growth when we we grow <laughs> unabated we grow unabated and use fossil fuels to grow. Yeah. Our economic development is a result of fossil fuels. I mean, I, I don't know any other way to look at it, but yeah. because we have a lot of fossil fuel, we've used the fossil fuel, we've developed the fossil fuel. And so now we're saying, well, yes, but you don't use fossil fuel. Or like in Brazil, yeah. where we say, don't cut down the rainforest, but we cut down all our forests hundreds of years ago. Right. So we had rainforests. We had forests. We've cut them down, but you can't cut yours down. So 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 it seems to me a little bit, I mean, doesn't it seem a little disingenuous for the rich countries to tell tell the poor countries what to do when the rich countries did it themselves? Well, it, it yeah, I'd, I'd say it's hypocritical uh, because you so we're saying, well, we uh, became rich, not everybody, but as a society very high per capita incomes and so on, based on fossil fuels. Now, you can't use the fossil fuels because we're worried about the climate and, and air quality and those kinds of climate in particular, I think is really driving this transition. And that's where I think maybe less preaching and more sharing of technologies and, and supporting uh, global financing mechanisms would make sense because that argument is is not going to work. <laughs> and And added to that is that lower income countries are just more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So they're also saying, well, you rich countries use fossil fuels, you created this problem, and now we're bearing the consequences. And now on top of that, you're saying we should use um, less fossil fuels when we, this is when we really need it because we're entering yeah. rapid growth phase. So I there there's a lot of um, <laughs> disingenuous arguments floating around, but I think support um don't don't shame um you know provide financing share technologies those kinds of things exactly so so one um of the fuels we have we haven't really addressed is natural gas so natural gas is um historically a really very clean burning fuel so what mm -hmm. have you found what, what, let me ask you this there's and and it's plentiful i mean the, the we have like an almost unlimited supply in the us of natural gas. We've capped so many ga natural gas wells. Um, why is there such this anti-natural gas? I mean, I, I get the oil and I get I, I, I get the combustion engines and that kind of stuff. But natural gas is a whole different animal, isn't it? Well, it, it's a different animal. And in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, the usual description is that you're getting about half the CO2 emissions from natural gas that you would get from coal. So that's good. And the the US's ability to stabilize and slightly decrease our our emissions are because natural gas is replacing coal. Right. Um 12 years ago coal was about 50% of electricity generation in the US. Now it's 20% floating plus or minus. Natural gas has, has made up most of the difference, renewables to some degree. The issue with natural gas is it's it's a fossil fuel, so there still are some carbon dioxide emissions. And if our goal is to get to zero, that's a problem. There's also the, the methane issue. So methane in the short term is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, there are different estimates uh, over the uh, the sort of the releases from the the natural gas production pipeline um, system, so there there is concern about methane. Um, we're seeing this play out at a at a local level in um, requirements that um, don't allow new natural gas, say stove hookups or natural gas heating hookups. In residential construction so and that's all part of this decarbonization <laughs> impulse to get fossil fuels out of the energy system um i think those fights will continue uh, natural gas certainly is better than coal there there still are climate related issues associated with natural gas and and maybe some health issues 
um, in terms of, you know, when you consume it in your kitchen, but yeah, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I I've got, I've got grandkids and a gas stove is so much safer for those grandkids than an electric stove. So, you know, I, I mean, for me, from a pure safety issue, uh, electric is far, electric stoves are far more dangerous than a natural gas stove. Cause when the gas is off, the heat's off. When the electricity is yeah. off, the heat's still on. And yeah. I, I just see, I, I, I have a tough time. I'm a, I'm, a, I, I admit, I have a tough time with that argument. Um, let's talk about uh, two, two things before we get and actually start talking about the incentives that I want to talk about. First is um, plastics. So plastics make play a major role. Of course, they're all, you know, carbon, um, uh, carbon fuel, right? They're all they all come out of oil. So how do you see that evolving? Because plastics are everything in the hospitals, plastic. You know, know. lifelines are plastic. Um, uh, there's a lot of plastic on electric cars. <laughs> so so how do you how do you see that? Do you see that just okay? Because you mentioned earlier that fossil fuels will you think I, I gathered that you think will have a place. They'll just be highly diminished. Is, is that how yeah. you see it with plastics as well? I think probably, um, again, looking toward mid-century, we'll still see a, a role for, say, natural gas in in that. One of the, the really toughest areas to decarbonize is in, in industrial applications. Right. Now, some... some like light industry and some processes, you can go to electricity and you know generate by renewables and so on. But there, there's some very tough areas: um, plastics, other chemicals, um, cement, <laughs> iron and steel production, where they need very high levels of heat, which mm -hmm. fossil fuels are good at delivering. Right. They also often use, as you pointed out, fossil fuels are just part of the production process. They're an input. Right. into production. So those are going to be the really, really tough areas. And that's where there's some expectations that maybe hydrogen can, can play a role, but hydrogen is like electricity. It takes energy to produce it. So the question is, where do you get that energy? Right. If you're getting it from coal or mostly, you know, it's from natural gas, there's still fossil fuels, so you still have an issue. Um, some very small percentage, 5% or less of hydrogen is, is termed green hydrogen produced through renewables. And, and that will have to in increase. But um, I think we've talked about the, the some of the toughest issues with the clean energy transition, balancing out the grid, integrating renewables into the grid, and some of these heavy industry applications and then things like aviation and marine shipping, those are going to be very, very those, are, those are challenging. And, and, and there's one more that we really haven't discussed. And that is, what do the poor and middle class do? Because, uh, you, you know, you have, I see cars. I mean, my son, frankly, is driving a car that he bought in 2007. Yeah. I drive a car that I bought in 2006 just because I like it. But he drives it because that's what is of you know really that's his car and for him to buy a new car he just he doesn't have the the, the funds to do that and I, I think he ought to learn on his own so um so so what what do you do about that I mean is that is, is that just providing incentives is that I mean because that would be trillions of dollars we're not talking about a, a few billion dollars here I mean if you are literally to go in and take away all those cars, um, first, you'd have a terrible issue in the junk pile, but second of all, and you put an enormous number of uh, people out of work um, who actually service those cars, et cetera, and all the all the the parts and all that kind of stuff. Um, but beyond that, just think about just the people who depend on those that cheap gas powered car. Um, how do you see that being solved? Yeah, well, Tom, you've you've identified a whole bundle of issues revolved around the the fairness of yeah. um, an energy transition, and I I I'm a big believer in really aggressively pursuing energy efficiency policies because that at least will help reduce costs. 
for lower income sure. groups. Yeah, and you you, you don't if you I mean, rent, you don't you I'll, don't control. You although don't the, although in the meantime, that. in the meantime, you've got you've got oil prices at historic highs. And that's what these people are relying on. So yeah. right now, I mean, it's not the rich people that are being hurt by $5 a gallon gas. It's right. the poor people that are being right. hurt by $5 a gallon gas. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and that's a big issue. And um, <clears throat> so we often, we, we know from various studies that low income households spend like six or 7% of their disposable income on energy, high income households, it's, you know, two percent or less. Um, so th there's a big energy burden built in. It's harder. A lot of these electric vehicle incentives um, are tax incentives. And, well, if you don't pay much in taxes, they don't do you much good. Um, it's hard to come up with the upfront capital to afford a lot of energy efficiency investments. So I think public policy has to give a lot of emphasis on affordability on um so sort of recycling revenues uh, california's um cap and trade program its emission trading program recycles money to low income communities and other people who who are affected by energy burdens there's also the um is usually called the just transition the whole issue of which you alluded to there are a lot of people's uh, a lot of jobs are going to be displaced. Overall, cl a clean energy, energy efficiency, renewables will probably create more jobs, but some are going to be lost and others gained, and they won't always be in the same place or by the same set of people. So we need to give a lot of attention to this issue of a just transition. And that's obviously greatly affected the whole coal industry now. The number of coal mining jobs right. is way down. We're going to see it play out in oil and gas. And even in auto manufacturing, it's yep. not only the, the repair. Electric vehicles are simpler, um, mm -hmm. so require less maintenance, but they're, they require fewer workers to manufacture. So okay. all of those are going to be very tough issues. So this is a social and economic and equity transition as well as a technology transition. Well, I, I appreciate your um, willingness to discuss those because not everybody's willing to discuss both sides and you've been very willing to do that. Let's finish up with incentives. So the Inflation Reduction Act, which I call the Inflation Enhancement Act, because um, I don't <laughs> think it did anything. Um, actually, I think it did a lot to increase inflation and nothing to reduce it. But uh, that aside, let's look at the energy policy here because we've long had, since Ronald Reagan, we've had major tax incentives for fossil fuels, right? You put in $100,000 into an oil development, uh, you get an $80,000 $80, deduction day one. Okay, so it's a huge incentive. You're only taxed on 85% of your income. With this new Inflation Reduction Act, now, um, Ignoring the electric the, the electric car incentives because I think they're actually minimal. They've actually reduced them um, in that because of the requirement for them to be built in the U.S. Yeah. And so there's only three car manufacturers that now qualify, um, whereas there were like 20 who qualified last year in 2022, 2023. There's three. Um, and so it's re actually reduced that. Um, that availability. And it's also you've also reduced the number of people who can uh uh, receive it because it's got income limitations. So while that's maybe a policy, it may make sense to the policymakers. Um, those people aren't buying cars. They're not buying the electric cars. The electric cars are still too expensive. So, but let's go to the other side of it, which is the energy production, the renewable, the solar, the wind, mm -hmm. those um, credits, because I think they're sub substantial because under, under, the, under the IRA, we have a 30% uh, tax credit, which goes through, I think, 2032 right now. So it was way extended. It was supposed to actually expire um, this year or next. And it's 30% plus if it's used on um, in, in investment property. This year, at least, we have uh, this bonus depreciation. So you still get to depreciate the equipment on top of that incentive. So basically, the way it works is um, if you're in a, in a high tax bracket, and of course, in investments come from high income people. We know that mm -hmm. um, that's where the investment comes from because they can afford to invest. Mm -hmm. And um, that investment. So basically, the government right now is paying anywhere from 60 to 65 percent 
of the cost of installing solar in a commercial situation. So um, how important do you see those types of incentives when it comes to developing the whole renewable energy energy and getting people to latch onto it? Yeah, I, I think they're, they're very important. And um, in the public policy field, we talk about carrots and sticks. So sticks is, you know, regulate or a carbon tax or something. And carrots are incentives like these, um, where you're um, smoothing the way financially. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act, I, I like to think of as a carrot cake because it's it's just full of carrots. And interestingly, a, a friend pointed out that it's um, the reason it it even could be passed was because it's it's a budget. It's seen as a budget measure. Right. It could be passed under the reconciliation provisions exactly. in the Senate. And so it was a, a simple majority and it was doable. Plus, that's generally more acceptance. Um, sticks are not um, too too politically popular these days. So I, I think they're really important. There have been studies of there's the production tax credit, which has been on and off for for decades. Right. And I've seen studies that find that when the when the production tax credit is in place, that wind investment um, goes up. And when it lapses, it goes down. So we we've had a a test. So people we do react. Know, to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, various studies of um, say electric vehicle incentives around the world find that they really do have an effect on behavior. So if our goal is to speed up the energy transition to increase investment and opportunities to to realize benefits and sort of level the playing field or even favor renewable clean energy sources, I think that can be very effective. And the Inflation Reduction Act does a lot of that. <laughs> it does, and, and way more than it actually says it does. Um, but um, so you see you see incentives continuing. In other words, you, you think those incentives are going to be needed to continue and other incentives are going to have to come in. They might have to adjust the incentives for the um, electric cars because that's that one's not working right now. Um, but the incentives for the solar and the wind are, as you said, they are. Yeah, I think, I think they'll work. And eventually, you, you know, you reach a decision where, well, do you really need these incentives anymore? I mean, um, we probably could have done away with a lot of the fossil fuel incentives some time ago, but my my first rule of politics is once you grant grant a benefit, hard to take it away. Hard to take it away. Yes. Exactly. exactly. So I, eventually, we're going to see the same thing with a lot of these renewables incentives and EV incentives, where they're out there, and it's going to be very difficult to take it away, even though maybe a lot of the logic for having them in place will have faded away because. On, in market terms, these are competitive technologies and products. Awesome. So, uh, Dan, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, any any final words, and where can we find out more about what you're doing? Um, well, uh, thanks, Tom. It's been, it's been a pleasure to talk with you today. So, yeah, I, I did this book with Polity Press, The Clean Energy Transition. And my goal was, it's very much aimed at students and others who want to just sort of grasp the outlines of a clean energy transition and, and some of the challenges, most of which we've we've talked about today. So I think that's very good. I teach at American University and direct the Center for Environmental Policy here and um, certainly invite people to follow that and, and other work. But it's been a pleasure talking with you. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Um, the book is The Clean Energy Transition. Uh, Dan Fiorino, from American University, thank you so much. And just remember, um, you know, from an investment standpoint, we're looking at where does the government want us to invest? And mm -hmm. very clearly, they want us to invest in renewable energy. So if if you want to do what the government wants done, then they will incentivize you and they will pay you to actually do that. And when you do, of course, you make way more money and way, pay way less tax. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.